When driving along Skyline Drive or hiking on one of Shenandoah National Park's many trails, the gorgeous mountain views seem to date from a time before human civilization. Yet people lived in these mountains for centuries. In the late 1600s, the Manahawk and the Monacan Native Americans living in the Blue Ridge Mountains were displaced by European farmers. More than two centuries later, the Virginia government forced thousands of people living on the same land to leave their homes and their way of life behind. These tragedies are hidden in the landscape of a triumph for the American people, the Shenandoah National Park. Thomas Jefferson's idea of the perfect Virginia farmer was one that grows enough food to support his family, with a small surplus to buy salt, sugar, coffee, and a little finery for his wife and daughter. As industrialization spread across the continent in the following century, the economy shifted away from the self-sustaining farmer. Nevertheless, in the early 1900s, most of the residents of the Shenandoah Mountains still lived Jefferson's dream on small farms that were relatively isolated from the rest of Virginia. In 1907, Congress voted to create a national park in the eastern part of the United States. Previous national parks had been created inland and on the west coast of the US. However, the east coast was much more developed, and so it was harder to find an available tract of land. A few people, including wealthy businessman George Freeman Pollock, proposed that the park be created in the beautiful mountains above the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Pollock owned Skyland, a resort on the ridge. He was heavily in debt, and so he was excited at the prospect of a new national park near his resort to bring in more business. Pollock and other park proponents created the Shenandoah Valley Association to gain support for the national park. Park supporters proposed creating Skyline Drive to allow city dwellers to enjoy Shenandoah's wilderness entirely from their automobiles. Supporters of the national park describe the landscape as pristine and uninhabited, even though about 500 families lived in the area. In order to create the national park, Virginia needed to obtain all of the land before transferring it to the federal government. This would mean that the families already living there would have to leave their homes. National Park supporters worked to convince the public of the benefits of removing the Shenandoah residents. George Freeman Pollock paid Miriam Sizer, an educator who worked in the mountains, to write reports emphasizing how uncivilized the mountain people were. She wrote, Steeped in ignorance, wrapped in self-satisfaction and complacency, possessed of little or no ambition, little sense of citizenship, little comprehension of law or respect for law, these people present a problem that demands and challenges the attention of thinking men and women. The 1933 study Hollow Folk backed up these allegations, describing the mountain community as backward and undeveloped. Many of their assertions were false, such as the suggestion that the mountain residents had never heard of the president or seen the American flag. And yet this book helped convince the educated population that the mountain people needed intervention. And this is back in the time in the 1920s and 30s when uh, social engineering wasn't looked down on like it is today. And so it wasn't just in Nazi Germany where they were trying to perfect the, 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 the race of people, but in this country somewhat as well. There were some people who came off the mountains that uh, were de designated as being feeble-minded and they were sterilized. A New York Times article wrote of the mountain residents, the level upon which they live is lower than even the worst of the others, so low that they seem the merest step above the grade of animals. Based on these reports, many people believed that eliminating the community would actually benefit the mountain residents in the long run. Between 1932 and 1933, state officials tried to convince residents to sell their land willingly, but many mountain residents did not want to leave their homes. At first, the officials didn't believe that this was an issue. President Hoover wrote to many mountain families to reassure them that they would not have to leave because of the new national park. However, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, that promise was forgotten. Many families did not hear about the park's proposal until the decision had already been made. Several families who had lived there for generations did not have the paperwork to prove that they owned the land, and they were evicted without payment. About 350 of the 500 families were temporarily allowed to stay in their homes under a special use permit while the national park was constructed. The mountain families were required to ask for permission to use the resources on their own land, 
permission was required for chopping down trees for firewood or harvesting their crops, which they had previously relied on for their family's survival. Roosevelt saw the creation of the National Park as a perfect opportunity to publicize the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> the CCC was part of his New Deal program, which meant to help areas recover from the Great Depression by employing local men in public service projects. However, the majority of the CCC workers in what became Shenandoah National Park were not local. The construction of the park also interfered with the family's daily lives. One woman wrote in a letter to a government official, Last winter, the CC boys come and blasted my road full of rocks and went away, and left my road in such bad shape we couldn't get a doctor in the whole winter. Many mountain residents expressed their concerns for their situation by writing letters to government officials. In the letters you can see people saying things like, I never caused the park no trouble, or um, I am a God-fearing man, or I am a Christian man, trying to convince park officials that they were worthy of being helped. So what that indicated to me as a rhetorician is that they understood that if they could persuade park officials that they were worthy and that they were cooperating with the park, then the park might be able to um, grant their request. As the park's completion grew near, the pressure grew for the families still living in the park. Several families who refused to move were arrested and dragged out of their houses with their belongings. To prevent the families from moving back into their old homes, officials often burned the buildings until only the stone chimneys remained. Some mountain families qualified for being given a homestead in the valley, but many others struggled to find affordable homes elsewhere. It was great, like I said, to have the parks for everybody to enjoy. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very sad to take the people's property and yeah, they gave them something else, but nothing close to what they had. You know, and it was hard for them. The Shenandoah National Park was dedicated on July 3rd, 1936 by President Roosevelt. We seek to pass on to our children a richer land and a stronger nation. And so my friends, I now take great pleasure in dedicating Shenandoah National Park. In many ways, Shenandoah National Park has proved to be as much of a triumph as Roosevelt had predicted. In 2017, the park boosted the local economy by $126 million. The natural ecosystem is able to thrive, giving a home to more than 200 bird species. The park's 516 miles of hiking trails give millions of people a connection to the rugged Virginia wilderness that they might not have had otherwise. For many decades, the National Park ignored the stories of the evicted mountain families. Descendants and their supporters are now creating monuments in the park to recognize the evicted mountain families through the Blue Ridge Heritage Project. I think part of the triumph has been, you know, there has been um, attention brought to, again, the sacrifices that our ancestors made and just create an awareness around, yes, you have this beautiful park today to enjoy, um, but you should also be aware that, you know, this is what needed to happen in order for you to have this great resource available. Understanding the history behind Shenandoah National Park's creation may provide insight into land disputes in the past and the present. I see Shenandoah National Park as a microcosm of the kinds of land disputes that this country has had since its very founding and even before its founding. Um, the American Indians lived on the land before white settlers got there. and. After white settlers were there, Virginia went through a lot of land disputes over whether the colonists owned the land or whether um, England owned the land. And so Shenandoah National Park represents a microcosm of that kind of dispute that was happening all over the country. Sharing Shenandoah's tragedies along with its triumphs will allow its visitors to understand what it took to create this beautiful national park. It was, it was hard feel sorry for them and I'm glad for everybody can remember the park for all of our grandparents. <laughs>